Okay, welcome back. Sorry about that. I was having um, internet issues and so I needed to take care of that and it automatically shut down the recording and so I had to start another video, which is fine, um, but you know, life happens. Okay, so uh, we were just talking about the process of refraction and what that means um, and how it relates to the process of vision, right? This idea that light comes in and bends. Um, and so you have to think about the, the curved surface of our eye and our lens itself, if you recall, is, uh, is that biconvex shape as well. So when light comes in, it's like passing through a football, right? It's going, it's going to bend as it passes through that. And so a convex lens, of course, has a bulge, like a football shape. A concave lens would be curved inward, kind of like a, I'm thinking of like a, a paper plate, how it kind of bends inwards, right? Imagine having two paper plates back to back. And so that concave shape uh, may be the shape of your, your eyeglass lenses, maybe, you know, depending on your corrective vision um, tools that you have. So we'll talk about that. But ultimately, all of that needs to come back and get focused on that fovea centralis. And so um, that, that's the job of our lens, adjusting and kind of either flattening or fattening in order, in order to direct the light there. And of course, that light, uh, that, that amount of fattening or flattening depends on how far away the image is that you're trying to, trying to see. Of course, I have another interruption. Hold up. Okay, always something. That's why I don't like to do lectures at home. Okay, so we were just talking about this concept that light comes in and bends and the shape of our lens is going to help aim that refracted light on the fovea centralis. We can skip on down ahead to this uh, next uh, concept of the emetropic state. So um, when our eye is focusing on distance objects, the, the eye is relaxed. Our retina is in its kind of resting form. Our eyes are meant to focus in far at far distances. So that's called the emetropic state. Um, the lens is, is normally kind of flat in that state, and um, there's minimal effort that your eye has to exert in terms of contracting the ciliary bodies and suspensory ligaments. Um, but when you start to focus on things that are closer, so for instance, I hold this pen in front of me, and now I'm looking at the pen instead of at my camera, um, I'm now having to adjust the shape of my lens fatten my lens so that the light bends harder at a sharper angle in order to get back to my retina. The process of that adjustment to, to adjust for far and near vision is called accommodation. So accommodation is this thicken, thickening of, of our lens. And so slide 74 shows this, um, it's figure 15.16 from your textbook. It shows this concept of accommodation looking at something far versus looking at something closer. Um, the ciliary body will relax when you're looking at distant objects, and then it will, which causes the lens to flatten, and then it will contract, which causes the lens to fatten when you're looking at something close. And that is the concept of accommodation. Um, there's other things that happen in order to focus on near and far things. One is pupillary constriction. So this is going to reduce the amount of light that scatters in our eye when we're looking at something further. Our pupils are going to be dilated to let in all of that light from that distant object. But when we're looking at something close, looking at my hands in front of my face, my pupils are going to get smaller to let less light in so that I can focus on that thing that's very, very close to me. The other thing is, is this concept of convergence. Because we have the, this binocular vision, two eye fields that intersect in the middle, imagine like two little like cones coming out from your eyes, that's your field of view, and that field of view overlaps somewhere in the middle. When you are looking at something that's closer, your eyes have to converge on that, right? You have to actually look and think about what, what's happening to your eye muscles, right? And again, in lab, we'll look at the eye muscles. In your textbook, the uh, extrinsic eye muscles were actually covered in the skeletal muscle chapter. Uh, but if you think about that, which, which uh, you know, muscles have to contract in order for you to look medially, right? This, this is your, your medial rectus muscle that has to contract to pull both of your eyes medial, as opposed to any other time 
where you're looking. This is gonna be your medial rectus that's contracting and your lateral rectus that's contracting over here. Usually they don't work at the same time like that when you look together. Now, both of your medial muscles have to contract. So it's a, a different neural process that has to do that. And so this is going to require extra training um, and, sh and strength on those eye muscles. So let's talk about some errors with refraction. So one is called near point accommodation. This is the, the closest point that your eye can actually focus on an object. And this increases with age because your lens becomes less flexible. So uh, this is why you sometimes see older people. I have my readers here. I'm old, I'm not ashamed to admit it. Get my readers on, right? And you'll be looking at something and say, oh, I can't really, can't really read this. What does this say, right? You get your little paper out in front of you and kind of, you know, and, and some people will even go as far to, as, so far to say like my arms aren't long enough right uh that that's what that is it's it's the fact that your your lens just doesn't have that plasticity anymore it can't it can't flatten it likes or can't can't fatten it likes to stay um flat presbyopia this is uh that when that near point accommodation becomes 20 inches or greater so this is that uh need for maybe bifocals or corrective lenses later in life um, and I've, I still just wear mine for fun. I don't really need them yet, but I like, I like to wear glasses. I don't know. It's something, it's like an accessory for your face. Um, other errors with, uh, accommodation could be possibly the, the length of your, your eyeball. Maybe your eyeball has a, an, an odd shape, which then would, you know, make the refraction happen at a different angle and it, it would be refracting at a different spot. Um, and so hyperopnea is, is that farsightedness. This is when your eyeball is actually too short. And so that focal point where your lens is meant and designed to focus is actually too far behind, um, behind your lens. Um, and so this will cause you to not be able to focus on things that are far away. So this will require a convex lens, a uh, corrective lens, to help the light converge more on your retina. And um, you can see that properly. Figure 15.17a shows you this. It's slide 81. And then you have myopia, which is the opposite. This is nearsightedness. This is when the distance between the cornea and the lens is too great. So maybe your eyeball is more elongated. The lens is unable to flatten um, any more than it already can in order to focus that light appropriately on that fovea. And so a concave lens would be used in this case. Um, more people are. Uh, far-sighted than near-sighted when it comes to uh, distortions of the eye. So usually when I, I teach this lecture, I will survey the class and I find most of my students are far-sighted um, instead of near-sighted. Um, and so there's also astigmatism. Uh, so astigmatism, this is when the lens itself or maybe even the cornea have an irregular shape. Um, and this, so, so a lot of times, even with the, uh, the refraction uh, disorders, it, it might not just be with both eyes, it might just be one versus the other. Um, and so the stigmatism, what this uh, basically means is, is now you have this odd shaped lens or odd shaped cornea that is causing an uneven refraction of the light when it comes into your eye, which can produce this kind of scattered or a haze-like appearance or um, things at night can appear very um, kind of streaky and there's lots of glares. Um, usually people with astigmatism, um, if it's a mild astigmatism, they might only need to wear glasses when they drive at night, something like that. So, um, and of course, LASIK is the surgery that uh, corrects that type of disorder. So LASIK, if you haven't um, looked into this, or if you don't know anyone that has done it, you might want to Google image search or uh, YouTube even uh, LASIK surgery. It's real. It's okay. It's gross. All right, but it is so cool. They literally they shave your cornea, ooh, right, collectively go, they, and they pull it open, and then um, they they will do the surgery, and that flap is kind of closed back down, and so you have a, a little bit of vision problems right after surgery, but afterwards. Um, you have increased uh, uh, acute vision. So it's a, a much better uh, remedy than you know, wearing glasses for the rest of your life if you don't like them. So let's talk about how we perceive light 
and the actual photoreceptors and the neurobiology associated with vision. So of course we have two types of, of photoreceptors in the back of our retina. You're probably familiar with them already. We have rods and we have cones. Uh, the cones are for color vision, they're for bright light. This is what give us our more um, acute vision. The, the rods, this is kind of like black versus white, dark versus bright type of vision. It's more for like outlines and periphery. Right, whereas our cones are what is giving us our, our high definition acute um, vision. So uh, I am going to do some drawing here finally. So um, if we think about the, I'm going to make this. I'm messing around with the camera so I can make sure that I know that this is centered or not in my, my field, but I'm just going to do this. Um, so. If we imagine the um, eyeball itself, right? So um, I guess I'll kind of draw it like this, right? So here's like the light passing in, right? When the light comes into the eye, it actually hits the very back part of the retina. The back part of the retina has what we call, um, it's a, a pigmented layer. And this pigmented layer absorbs, absorbs the, um, there we go, pigmented layer. This pigmented layer absorbs the light. So whatever light is coming in gets absorbed. It's kind of like the, the backboard of our eye. Um, and in, on top of that layer are our photoreceptors, our rods and cones. You can see what I'm, what I'm trying to draw here is actually figure 15.18 from your textbook. So you have that pigmented layer. And then we have this layer of rods which I'm just drawing them like little columns. And then we have a, a concentrated area right, kind of right towards the back of the eye where those cones would be, right? And then more rods off to the side for our periphery. So we have that photo, photosensitive area. So the light, light gets absorbed on that very back line and then different, uh, there's specialized receptors called photoreceptors. So, so far we've talked about like chemoreceptors, mechanoreceptors, right? Tactile receptors. So the photoreceptors, rods and cones, those are sensitive to light waves of, of light. They're, they're receptive to those energy waves, right? Remember that electromagnetic spectrum, like 500 nanometers, right? Whatever the wavelengths are, they're sensitive to those different wavelengths. And so they'll be activated based on which wavelengths of light are hitting that pigmented layer. On top of that pigmented layer, we have another layer of cells called bipolar cells. So these bipolar cells, can't get my marker open. These bipolar cells are um, bipolar sensory neurons. So we've talked about those before, and this is not to scale by the way, so, um, but I'm just drawing them so that you can kind of get the idea, right? We'd have all of these bipolar cells across the back of our retina. And then on top of these bipolar cells, we would have another layer of, um, they're called ganglion uh, cells. And so all of these ganglia cells, their, their axons all kind of run together and converge and exit out the back of the eye. So we have a pigmented layer, our photoreceptors, bipolar cells, and then the ganglion cells whose axons converge to create our optic nerve, right? Which leaves the back of the eye. This would technically be the blind spot right there, correct? Hopefully you're following this. So there's these four layers to our retina. So when we look at the retina in lab, you're just gonna see this kind of like orangey reddish layer, but it's actually four cell layers thick. So the physiology behind perceiving light is this pigmented layer absorbs the light rays the wavelengths of light activate either a rod or a cone. You have different types of cones. You have red, green, blue, green cones. And so the different uh, wavelengths of light will activate one type of cone or another or a blend, right? Depending on what color you're perceiving. That will then activate the bipolar cells, right? Uh, the activation of those bipolar cells then will send a signal, right? Neurotransmitters to our ganglion cells. Those ganglion cells exit and go back out to the optic chiasm, cross over. They actually will pass through the thalamus. Um, and then from the thalamus, they'll radiate out both to our primary sensory 
uh, area and to our midbrain and to our primary visual cortex. So, um, so it's a, a little bit of the, the pathway there in the lecture and your textbook go on to describe it as well. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how your uh, retina was actually put together. Uh, figure 15.21 shows you the, uh, the specific anatomy and how a rod compares to a cone on the back of the retina and what's happening in the light versus in the dark. So there's actually some complex physiology here that we're skipping over because of time purposes. So in your textbook, it talks about opsin and rhodopsin and all of these different things and this biochemical pathway, this dark current and all of these things. You don't have to know those things um, in order to understand uh, vision for your tests and quizzes. You should understand the one, two, three pathways that are listed here in figure 15.1. So if you look at in the dark what's happening, the photoreceptor depolarizes, it releases something called glutamate, which is a uh, neurotransmitter to the bipolar cells. The bipolar cells will then release neurotransmitters to the ganglion cells, and the ganglion does not, it's an inhibitory response, the ganglion does not send a uh, an action potential. In the light, we have the opposite going on. In the light, we have that, those light-sensitive photoreceptors, uh, they stop releasing glutamate. And then that removing the glutamate will basically remove the inhibition and allow your photoreceptors to perceive the light. So glutamate is the neurotransmitter that's kind of like a break, right? Your eyes are always, they always have the brakes on, and then when the brakes are taken off, now you can see the light, right? And glutamate acts as the the break for color vision and light vision. So um, we get into the visual pathway. So it starts with that, that visual field, our, 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 our vision, our field of vision, that light gets refracted onto the focal point on the back of our retina. And then figure 15.22 shows you this pathway, uh, exactly what I was just describing, crossing over at the optic chiasm, going back to the thalamus and then radiating out uh, from the superior colliculus of the midbrain and then back to our visual cortex um, so that we can perceive vision and interpret it consciously. Um, the optic chiasm uh, serves as that crossover point, just like everything. We have that lateralization that takes place in our cerebral hemispheres, right controls left, left controls right, and vice versa. And um, you see the visual pathway field of view um, in figure 15.22, right, showing you that idea of binocular vision and, and how we see things um, in terms of our fields of view for each eyeball. So we have the optic tracts, right, which carry that information back um, from the right and left eyes. Uh, the specific place in the thalamus that that information is taken to is called the lateral geniculate nucleus. The medial geniculate nucleus is for hearing. Uh, the lateral is for vision. And this is all in the thalamus. And then from there, it radiates to our primary visual cortex, um, as we mentioned. So there's some association areas that are um, also involved, and that will help us interpret and make associations. That's why they're called association areas, right? That's why when you, when you see a face, you're like, oh, that's my mom, right? You're going to associate that with something, right? Um, and so that's why those association areas are called association areas. So we're gonna switch gears and talk about the ear. I'm actually gonna stop this recording and start a new one to kind of chunk this information a little bit for you. Bye.